In the previous video, I talked about extrema, minima, maxima, and saddle points, and showed how to use the gradient to find them. In this video, I want to talk about classifying those extrema. How do I know algebraically which extrema are minima, maxima, saddles, something else, something unclassifiable? This is a much more complicated question than it was for single variable calculus. In single variable calculus, I could just look to the left and the right. But now I have infinitely, infinitely many directions around a point, and so many possible behaviors. I need a formal method to classify extrema. I had such a method for single variable calculus using the second derivative. For a critical point x of a single variable function, the critical point was a minimum if the second derivative was positive. It was concave up, and the minimum is at the bottom of a concave up curve. And the critical point was a maximum if the second derivative was negative. It was concave down, and a maximum is at the top of a concave down curve. And if the second derivative was zero, it was inconclusive. It might be a minimum, a maximum, or neither. So I want to extend this process to use second derivatives of scalar fields to classify their extrema. Let me go back to partials then. Since I can take various different partial derivatives, there are in fact many second derivatives of the scalar field depending on which partials I apply. There is a nice way to organize these second derivatives. I can put them into a square matrix. This video will have a bunch of content about matrices which come from linear algebra. I'll give all the matrix detail for the benefit of those of you who have linear algebra, but the matrix detail is not necessary here. I will give you an algorithm at the end that doesn't require any understanding of matrices at all, so that no matrix algebra is necessary for the activities or the assignment. Anyway, for a two-variable scalar field, there are four different partial second derivatives. The pure second partial in x, the pure second partial in y, and the two mixed partials in either order. Clairaut's theorem from before says that these mixed partials are equal in most circumstances, but the theory here needs to consider them as distinct. These four derivatives are nicely put into this matrix. And the same can be done for a three-variable scalar field where there are nine second partials, nine combinations of doing the three partials in either order. And please convince yourself that the partials in this matrix are in fact all of the second partials of a three-variable scalar field. This matrix of second partial derivatives is called the Hessian matrix. Please do not confuse it with the Jacobian matrix, which was a non-square matrix of the first partial derivatives that I used in the linear approximation video last week. The Hessian matrix, much like the second derivative, determines the behavior of the extrema. More specifically, the determinant of the Hessian determines this behavior. Those of you with linear algebra will recognize that this expression, d, is the determinant of the 2 by 2 matrix here. For the rest of you, you can simply use this expression for d. I will, however, call d the Hessian determinant throughout. The Hessian determinant is the product of the two pure partials minus the product of the, mis of, <laughs> of the mixed partials. Assuming the conditions of Clairaut's theorem, which will be always true for the examples in this course, the mixed partials are equal, so the second term can be written as either mixed partial squared. So, how does this work? Well, the Hessian determinant d is very much like a measure of concavity. And there is a nice theme here for second derivatives, always capturing the concavity behavior. For single variable functions, the second derivative directly measured concavity for parametric curves, concavity is sort of like curvature, the direction the path was curving and how tightly it was curving. And curvature was indeed a second derivative. If you go back and trace the definitions of curvature, you will find that it requires two derivatives of the curve to get to curvature, but not more than two. In general, when thinking about second derivatives in any context, I like to conceptually think of concavity and curvature as what all these second derivatives are talking about. So, say I have a scalar field of two variables, and a critical point that is, a point where the gradient is zero. If the Hessian determinant is positive, that indicates consistent concavity. Then, if the pure partial in x is also positive, 
That indicates that the graph is concave up. It looks like the bottom of a valley, with all the directions curving up from that point. And that point must be a minimum. If D is still positive, but the pure second partial in X is negative, that indicates concave down. The graph looks like the top of a peak, with all the directions curving down, and that point must be a maximum. However, if D is negative, that indicates that the concavity is inconsistent. Not all directions curve the same way. This indicates a saddle point, a point where there is a maximum in some direction, those directions curve down from the point, and a minimum in other directions, those directions curve up from the point. Finally, like the second derivative test for single variable functions, if the Hessian determinant is zero, the test is inconclusive. Any number of behaviors are possible, including minima, maxima, saddles, or points that be, can't, can't be classified as any of these. Now, this slide is solely for the benefit of those of you with linear algebra, and I will not insist that any of you use this language or analysis, but this is such a great application of the ideas of linear algebra that I would be remiss if I didn't share it. I did the two-variable case in the last slide, but how does that extend to scalar fields of more than two variables? Well, it still comes down to the Hessian matrix, but the analysis gets more complicated. It depends on eigenvalues. If U is a critical point of the scalar field, then I can calculate the Hessian matrix, evaluate all of those partials at a point U to get a matrix of just numbers. That matrix has a spectrum, a collection of eigenvalues. And here are the cases. If all of the eigenvalues are positive, the critical point is a minimum. Positive eigenvalues indicate directions that are concave up, so if everything is concave up, it must be a minimum. And if all of the eigenvalues are negative, the critical point is a maximum. Negative eigenvalues indicate directions that are concave down, so if everything is concave down, it must be a maximum. If all of the eigenvalues are non-zero, but they are a mix of positive and negative, then the point is something like a saddle point. In higher dimensions, it can have several directions of increase and several directions of decrease. Each negative eigenvalue indicates a direction of increase, and each positive eigenvalue indicates a direction of decrease. And finally, if any eigenvalue is zero, which makes the determinant zero as well, then the test is, as always, inconclusive. Again, if you have no idea what an eigenvalue is, don't worry about it. But if you do know what an eigenvalue is, I hope it's somewhat fascinating to see how they show up here, that the classification of maxima, minima, and other more complicated extreme of scalar fields, a piece of calculus that isn't immediately at all like linear algebra, is entirely understood and controlled by calculating the eigenvalues of a particular matrix. That diversion into linear algebra over let me do a few examples. Here is a scalar field in two variables. I calculate its partials. The gradient is zero at points where all the partials are zero. Solving this always results in a system of equations, and in this case, as long as y is zero, both the partials vanish. So all the points a0 for any x value a are critical points. Then I calculate the second partials the pure partials in x and y, as well as the mixed partial. I use these to calculate the Hessian determinant, the product of the pure partials minus the mixed partial squared. I simplify it a little bit, and then I can evaluate d at any point a0. Since y shows up in every term of d, d is zero at all of these critical points. Therefore, the test is inconclusive here. Here is the picture of the previous function. The critical points were the points a0, and that forms a line when y equals 0. It is generally true that if there is a line or curve of critical points, the Hessian determinant will fail. The reason it fails is that all these points are minimums in one direction, the x direction on this graph, but there is no change along the line, and since there is no concavity on the line for the Hessian to measure, it tends to give 0 along such lines. Here is another example, another scalar field of two variables. I calculate the partials and set them both to zero. In this case, the point 2, negative 1 is the only solution. Then I calculate the second partials and the Hessian determinant. 
In this case, d is the product of the pure partials, 2 times 4, minus the mixed partial square, which is just 0 squared, so d is 8. This is positive, and the pure partial in x is also positive. In the classification scheme earlier, such data indicates a minimum. And if I look at the graph, I do in see, indeed see that there is a minimum at the point 2, negative 1. Finally, let me do one last example. Here is one more scalar field of two variables. I could calculate, I calculate its partials and I set them to zero. This is a more complicated system. The x partial is zero when x is two or zero, and the y partial is zero when y is three or zero, and all combinations of these give critical points. So there are four, zero, 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 three, two, zero, and two, three. If I put any of these four points into the partials, both partials will evaluate to zero. Then I calculate the second partials and the Hessian determinant. Skipping a bit over the calculation details here, I find that the Hessian determinant has this form, 48 times x times y times 4 minus 3x times 2 minus y. Then I can test the Hessian determinant at each of the four critical points. For the first three, whenever either x or y is 0, all of d is 0, since x and y are divisors of d. Therefore, the first three points all give d equals 0, and the test is inconclusive. For the fourth point, however, 2, 3, the Hessian determinant is positive. x, y, 4 minus 3x, and 2 minus y are all positive and multiplied together to get something positive. And then if I went back to the pure x partial, I would find that the pure x partial at 2, 3 is negative. And the data of a positive Hessian determinant and a negative pure x partial be gives me a maximum at 2, 3. And here is the graph of the scalar field. The top peak here is indeed the point 2, 3, and it is a maximum. The other three critical points are these other points I can label in the graph, and each of them is a point, point where the function levels off but then descends again. They are neither minimum, maxima, or saddle points. They are like the point 0, 0 on the single variable cubic. The derivatives momentarily vanish, but the upward or downward trajectory of the function continues as before. And this is the other kind of point, other than the lines of critical points in the first example, where I would expect the Hessian determinant to fail.